Imagine a man who, in his lifetime, mastered martial arts, literature, calligraphy, painting, and administration. A man who would launch his nation to the strongest position it had ever been through its history, in size, economy, and military power. Finally, imagine him becoming the longest living leader in the history of his nation. Such can be described a fascinating life of the Chinese Emperor Qianlong. In 1711, future Emperor Qianlong, whose personal name was Hongli, was born in the Yonghe Palace of Beijing. He was born outside not only the Forbidden City, but the Imperial City as well, as he wasn't the son of the incumbent Emperor Kangxi. Hongli was in fact his grandson through Prince Yinzhen, who would later become Emperor Yongzhang. Kangxi, adhering strongly to the values of Confucianism, aimed to be a benevolent leader and have a flawless reign. He therefore looked for similar qualities within his descendants. Kangxi reportedly met his grandson Hongli for the first time when he was 10 years old and immediately took a liking to the boy, who proved to be very bright. Hongli showed indeed great intellectual capacities, having been given a great education thanks to his father Prince Yinzhen, being tutored by high-ranking officials. An anecdote recalls that around the age of 11, Hongli went on a hunting trip with his grandfather Kangxi. They were suddenly surprised and attacked by a bear. While the animal was being killed, the child Hongli managed to stay calm and kept riding his pony, maintaining his mount under control. This was noted by Kangxi, who developed a preference for his grandson. The emperor, however, died soon after in December 1722, and his son Yinzhen managed to ascend the throne, becoming Emperor Yongzhang. Hongli was now an imperial prince. At that period, only one elder brother to him, Hongshi, had survived infancy. However, because Emperor Yongzhang saw Hongshi as unworthy due to his behavior, he already secretly favored Hongli to later succeed him. This choice was further reinforced by the fact that while alive, Kangxi himself preferred Hongli to other grandsons. Consequently, Hongshi sided with his uncle, Prince Yinsi, Yongzhang's brother and political rival. In his first months of rule, Emperor Yongzhang focused on securing his unstable position. To do so, he banished some of his rival brothers, including Prince Yinsi, from the Manchu Imperial Aishinjoro clan. In the imperial decree ordering this, Yin Si was stripped of his title and imprisoned, and Yongzheng, trying to repudiate his eldest son, added, Hong Shi can become Yin Si's son if he wishes to. Associated with his disgraced uncle, Hong Shi fell out of favor and was prohibited from access to the Forbidden City. Possibly out of pride or spite, he refused to repent and ask for forgiveness to his father, which enraged Yongzheng. In 1726, the emperor struck his eldest son's name from imperial records. A year later, Hongshi died, probably having been forced to commit suicide so that Hongli could become the next in line to the throne. Yongzheng's other son, Hongzhou, younger brother of Hongli, did not care for politics and stayed out of the rivalry. All was set for Hongli to succeed his father. In 1733, nearing the end of his father Yongzheng's reign, Hongli was elevated to the title of Prince of First Rank. This position allowed him to start dealing with state affairs directly, learning the skills of governance. When his father was away, he regularly appointed Hongli to rule in his absence. To ensure a smooth succession between himself and Hongli, Emperor Yongzheng devised a new method of choosing a successor, the secret designation of the Crown Prince, that I've discussed in my Yongzheng video, links in the description below. For more than two years, the young prince would live comfortably in the capital, practicing martial arts, calligraphy, and managing several state affairs. In 1735, when Hong Li was 25 years old, his father Yongzhang died after 13 years of reign. Through the secret designation of the crown prince, Hong Li was revealed to be selected as a successor and ascended the throne, becoming Emperor Qianlong. Thanks to his father's political and economical measures, the Qing Emperor now held total authority. The economy of the empire was strong and its population content. The Qing officials were eager to see how Qianlong would rule. As they would discover, the Emperor would partake in many military expeditions that would later be branded as the Ten Great Campaigns. They would however be more or less successful. 
The first issue of the young emperor's rule was a rebellion of Miao people in the south of the nation soon after his ascension to the throne. The local Qing authorities were rapidly overwhelmed by the tribe's sudden uprising against the dynasty's rule and prepared to make concessions to the rebels. However, upon learning of the situation, Qianlong, wishing to prove his worth, sent for trusted generals to crush the uprising. Over the next two months, 18,000 Miao rebels were killed and by late 1736, order was restored in the region. Opposition was nonetheless still strong in the Miao peoples, who would rebel again later in history. This first success allowed Qianlong to be well perceived by many officials. The emperor, however, would not rest on his laurels. It was now time to deal with an old issue that had begun under his grandfather Kangxi's reign. The Dzonga Mongols, now led by their Khan Galdan Siren, had been periodically quarrelling with the Qing dynasty since 1689. Qianlong, wishing to pacify the borders of the empire, organised talks with the Dzongars. At the terms of the negotiations, both sides accepted to designate the Altai Mountains as a boundary between both territories, and the Dzunga Khanate officially became a tributary state of the Qing dynasty. Guldan Siren would then develop the economy and military of his state with the help of a captured Swedish officer, which would lead to other events later on. The Miao people made another insurgency in 1740 that was rapidly quenched. Qianlong would now focus this first period of his reign on making reforms in the military and solving economic issues. In the northern regions, food became scarce and prices reached concerning amounts. Fearing this would lead to a famine, the authorities were anxious to take action. Qianlong first considered the situation was caused by breweries using grain to make wine, so he prohibited the activities of breweries. This was of little effect, and soon food prices soared. Evidently, food production had to be increased. In a first measure, the emperor allowed Han populations to emigrate along the Liao River in its river valley in Manchuria, a territory normally reserved exclusively to ethnic Manchus. Han peasants, once relocated in those regions, began farming the land. Consequently, practically 600,000 acres of agriculture were formed. As a side effect, Han Chinese populations slowly grew to become the majority group in Manchurian urban zones, replacing the Manchus over the next few decades. As farming, commerce and crafted good production increased, the treasury and population of the empire reached unprecedented amounts. In 1743, Qianlong organized a journey to visit the imperial mausoleums of his forefathers, centered around Nur Haqi, predecessor to the Qing dynasty. These were the Yongling tomb, containing the remains of Nur Haqi's father, grandfather and great-grandfather, Nur Haqi's own Fuling mausoleum, and his son Huang Taiji's Zhaoling mausoleum. The emperor conducted their sacrificial ceremonies to honor his ancestors. He then stayed in Mukden, Monday Shenyang, the capital of Manchuria, and composed a fu, a kind of long traditional poem in classical Chinese, to express the beauty of the region and claim the Qing dynasty would prevail through time. Back in Beijing, Emperor Qianlong converted the Yonghe Palace, his birthplace, into an imperial building, replacing its traditional turquoise tiles by imperial grade yellow tiles. His father had converted part of the palace into a Tibetan Buddhist temple, but Qianlong made all of it a religious building, hosting many Buddhist lamas. The Yonghe became the national center for Tibetan Buddhism, proving that the Qing emperors presented themselves as patrons of the religion. During his reign, Qianlong would further prove to be a strong supporter of Tibetan Buddhist arts, translating many canons. It is even suspected that in his life, Qianlong slowly came to embrace Tibetan Buddhism as his religion, as many artifacts and scriptures in neither Chinese nor Manchu, but Tibetan, would be discovered in his tomb later in history. In parallel, persecution of Christians began to increase at a significant rate. Christianity had indeed been outlawed by Yongzheng in 1724 due to the Chinese rights controversy, and repression of Christians was now beginning to take place throughout the empire. The only ones that were spared from this persecution were Jesuit scholars working in Beijing. The Jesuits had fallen out of favour of the papacy and were facing criticism in the West. Ironically, they were well perceived by Qianlong for their knowledge. The emperor particularly enjoyed Jesuit painters as he appreciated the European perspective on this form of art. 
One of them, Giuseppe Castiglioni, was particularly appreciated by Qianlong. He had arrived in 1715 in China, back under Kangxi's reign, but it was under the current emperor that he really rose to prominence. Qianlong would commission from him a series of paintings depicting his military conquests, as well as many portraits of himself and of his concubines. The emperor also commissioned many European clocks to be made from Jesuit artisans. Quite fond of European art, he would also recruit Giuseppe Castiglioni to work on the Si Yanglo or Western Mansions, European-style imperial buildings on the ground of the Old Summer Palace in Beijing. They would later be destroyed in 1860 during the Second Opium War. The emperor's attention would however be brought back to the military again, as a new rebellion broke out. This time, the problem was in the Jinchuan region, in the southwest of China. During the Ming Dynasty, to ensure a smooth Confucian ruling over the local people who practiced Tibetan Buddhism, a system of tribe leaders called Tulsa had been put in place. Rivalries between the different Tulsa developed, so under Yongzhang's rule, bureaucratization of the Tulsa on the Qing administration was began. It was not well received by the Jinchuan tribes. One of their chieftains, Zlod Bom, aimed to rebel. He attacked a rival pro Qing tribe and prepared an uprising. The Grand Council, central military institution of the Qing dynasty, mobilized 30,000 men in 1747 to pacify the area. Unfamiliar with the hostile terrain, and not expecting that the Jinchuan tribes had planned out and built strong fortifications, the first Qing wave was defeated. A year after, in 1748, Qianlong ordered 40,000 men to be sent as reinforcements in Sichuan province. The expedition was once more unsuccessful, this time for a variety of reasons. Disagreements within the leading personnel of the Qing force, a Jinchuan spy in high position, and an inexperienced commander led to the disorganization and failure of the expedition. Angered, Qianlong had the commanding general executed and replaced by a more experienced general, Fu Hong, who was able to remove the Jinchuan spies, reorganize the campaign, and pacify the area in 1749. This was the first of the Ten Great Campaigns, although in reality it was a very costly war in both lives and resources. Since his great-grandfather Shun Zhe had embraced Chinese identity a century ago, Qianlong now realized that the Manchu heritage was slowly being diluted into Chinese culture. In order to preserve his people's identity, Qianlong ordered the compilation of many works concerning its history and genealogy. In 1747, he secretly commissioned the compilation of the Shamanic Code, as shamanism was still the dominant, albeit fading, religion of the Manchu people. Much like Kangxi, Qianlong often organized inspection tours through the country. During a southern inspection tour in 1748, Qianlong's primary consort, Empress Xiao Xianchun, fell ill and died. The emperor was devastated and apparently stayed heartbroken for the rest of his life. But the emperor had no time to dwell on such events. After a period of mourning, he returned to the affairs of the state. Following the steps of his father Yongzhang, who had awarded Zhu Zhelian, supposed heir to the Zhu family, reigning family during the Ming Dynasty, the hereditary title of Marquis in 1725, Qianlong enhanced the title into Marquis of Extended Grace in 1750. This title would continuously be inherited through the Zhu family until the death of its final holder around the mid-20th century. The Qing Empire was growing stronger and stronger. New problems, however, appeared in Tibet, an area on the protectorate, already troublesome for the Qing. At that time, there were three figures of authority in the mountainous region. The regent, Bo La Nas, who more or less freely ruled Tibet as a tributary state to the Qing from the Tangyaling Temple. Two Angbangs, Qing officials who supervised his activities and could enforce Qing policies from the Yaman residence. And the seventh Dalai Lama, religious leader of Tibetan Buddhism from the Potala Palace. The regent had bad relations with the Dalai Lama. When he died in 1747, his more assertive son, Yurme Namyal, succeeded him. Under his rule, relations with the Dalai Lama worsened even more, and the Angbang suspected that the new regent was preparing to take over Tibet by isolating the Dalai Lama and rebelling against the Qing. In a preventive move, the Angbangs decided to deal with the new regent. They summoned him in 1750 
to the Yaman residence for administrative purposes and assassinated him. While they were clearing up evidence, his chamberlain, who had survived, was able to escape and promptly spread the news. In only a few hours, hundreds and hundreds of outraged Tibetan men gathered in front of the residence of the Angbangs. As efforts to mediate the conflict failed, it was clear that the Qing officials would not survive the riot. One Angbang killed himself in despair, and the other died fighting the insurgents, who then began attacking Han Chinese residents of Lhasa. Upon learning of the situation, Qianlong was furious and dispatched several hundred men to march on Lhasa. In 1751, the Tibetan regency was dismantled and the 7th Dalai Lama became the main political authority in Tibet. However, new Qing Angbangs were sent to Lhasa to supervise his action. Qianlong made efforts to make the Qing dynasty and China the same entity. He insisted that China was not only China proper and populated by Han Chinese, but everything within the borders of the Qing dynasty and the multi-ethnic state. He declared in 1755, There exists a view of China, according to which non-Han people cannot become China's subjects and their lands cannot be integrated into the territory of China. This does not represent our dynasty's understanding of China but is instead that of the earlier Han, Tang, Song and Ming dynasties. Qianlong's attention would however soon be recalled to the military, as he would organise three more of his ten great campaigns. Gardan Tsiren of the Dzungars, with whom the emperor had negotiated a peace agreement earlier in his reign, had died. His rule had maintained unity in the area, and a violent succession dispute erupted, amidst which Uyghur lords rebelled against their Dzungar Mongol overlords. The Khanate was in chaos, but a Dzungar noble, Dawachi, managed to claim the title of Khan. His main rival, Amursana, fled to the Qing Empire in 1754 and requested an audience with Qianlong. He decided to swear fealty to the dynasty and managed to convince Qianlong to launch a campaign to overthrow Dawachi. Fighting in Dzungaria would require intense preparations. Over the next two months, a multi-ethnic army of over 50,000 men was assembled, comprised of Manchu, Han, Mongol and Uyghur soldiers, and led by Mongol general Ban Di. They departed in 1755. In less than a hundred days, during which skirmishes and battles took place along the Ili River, the Qing armies were at the gates of Gulja, the capital of the Khanate. Dawachi surrendered. To settle the instability in Dzungaria, Qianlong dissolved the Dzungar Khanate into four regions according to the four Oirat Mongol tribes. He appointed Amursana as leader of one of the four tribes, but this would lead to another problem, as the Dzungar lord had wished to take over all of Dzungaria. The vast majority of the Qing army then withdrew from the region, leaving behind only a small garrison in Gulja. Shortly after, Amursana allied himself with another Mongol lord and openly rebelled against the Qing in his aim to rebuild the Dzungar Khanate. Commanding General Ban Di, caught off guard, was encircled and decided to take his own life. This new rebellion was unacceptable for the Emperor. In 1757, after more preparations, Qianlong launched the second campaigns against the Dzungars. Zhao Hui, a seasoned general who had seen action in the Jinchuan campaigns, was appointed. After several battles, Amursana was defeated and fled to Russian Siberia, where he died of smallpox. Qianlong then demanded and his body be transferred over back to Qing lands for posthumous punishments, but the Russians refused. In retaliation, Qianlong arrested several Russian Orthodox monks in Beijing and threatened to cut off trade between China and Russia. In the end, Amursana's body was never transferred, and the diplomatic incident was gradually resolved. With Dzungaria pacified once more, three of the ten great campaigns had been completed. Frustrated by all these events, Qianlong stayed outraged at the Dzungar rebellions. They had indeed cost the treasury tremendous amounts of money and unstabilized the empire. Wishing to make an example of the remaining Dzungar men, he declared, Show no mercy at all to these rebels. Only the old and weak should be spared. Our previous military campaigns were too lenient. If we act as before, our troops will withdraw and further trouble will occur. If a rebel is captured and his followers wish to surrender, he must personally come to the garrison, prostrate himself before the commander and request surrender. If he only sends someone to request submission, it is undoubtedly a trick. 
Tell Tsingojov to massacre all these crafty Dzungars. Do not believe what they say. In retaliation for the two campaigns, the Dzungar Mongols were almost entirely wiped out. Scholar Wei Yuan estimated that 50% of the Dzungar households were killed by smallpox, 20% fled to Russia or the Kazakh Khanate, and 30% were killed by the Qing army. Leaving no yurts in an area for several thousand li, except those of the surrendered. In this event, baptized the Dzungar Genocide, roughly 80%, over half a million people, were killed, including women, children and the elderly. The vastly depopulated area was soon settled by Han Chinese people. Peace in the region was however not yet achieved. Two Uyghur Khoja, or Muslim lords, who were brothers, would become the next opponents of Qianlong. They had previously been captors of the Dzungars, but after Qianlong's first expedition in 1755, they were freed, and soon after began raising troops. During the second expedition against Amursana, they had taken advantage of the political turmoil to secure control over the southwest part of Dzungaria. Now, they ruled over the area with an iron fist and rebelled in turn against the Qing's claim on the region in 1758. Soon joined by remnants of the Dzungar Khanate and Kyrgyz allies, they managed to overwhelm the local Qing authorities, who had to call for help from Beijing in 1759. At this point, Qianlong was fed up with the issue. In order to pacify the region once and for all, he dispatched over 10,000 elite soldiers from the Eight Banners, as well as the famous Camel Artillery, led by General Zhao Hui. Within a few months, the Muslim brothers were defeated. Although the rebellion had been put to an end, it would inspire a continuous Muslim jihad against the Qing that would last for over a century. Nonetheless, the pacification of this new region annexed into the empire under the name of Xinjiang, or New Frontier, was complete for now. In 25 years, the emperor had already done more for China than many other emperors in their entire life. Qianlong would however accomplish much more in his long reign. His ambition would lead to the fifth great campaign that would take place in the jungles of Southeast Asia. As one of Qianlong's main priority was to tighten control on border regions, tensions with neighbors could easily appear. This would exactly be the case in Yunnan province, where the Qing shared a border with the Kingdom of Burma. While that nation was preoccupied with internal rebellions and wars, China could effectively secure control over the border region and several of the multitude of Shan states, petty kingdoms inhabited by Shan people. In parallel, by 1752, a new dynasty, the Gongbang, took control of Burma. Its leader, the new king Alangboya, then sought to re-establish Burmese authority in the border region and Shan states. After he invaded them, their local rulers, who had more or less become subjects of the Qing, fled to Yunnan and asked the Chinese forces to intervene. The Yunnanese authorities relayed the message to Qianlong in 1759. He was quick to issue a new imperial edict. The border states would be captured from the Burmese. However, as the mighty Qing dynasty would realize, this new conflict would prove disastrous for the Chinese. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it, if so please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. The second part will be available shortly. If you have any questions or requests, feel free to leave them in the comment section below.